Father, thank you for the day, and God, I just thank you for Wednesday night Bible study, and God, I just pray, Lord, you be with us in a special way this night. I thank you for our WANA program going on. I thank you for the men's Bible study and the youth, and uh, God, just uh, be with us as we study your word. And God, I just pray, Lord, uh, that maybe we'll just remember one thing uh, from this lesson uh, that we can apply in our lives. So God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings 19 for me, if you would. 1 Kings 19. And we're going to talk about tonight about in the valley. In the valley. And uh, my outline, number one, Elijah running from Jezebel. Elijah running from Jezebel. And uh, we know Jezebel was Ahab's wife, and she was one mean lady, all right? And we'll talk about that in here in just a minute. Number two, Elijah in a cave. Elijah in a cave. Number three, God speaking to Elijah. God speaking to Elijah. In 1 Kings 18, uh, we have to remember the Mount Carmel battle. Uh, Elijah against the prophets of Baal, 450. And, uh, you know, how God just did a miraculous work there. Uh, they were, you know, from sunup to sundown, just about trying to call on their gods, uh, the God of Baal, and nothing happened. And Elijah, you know, the, the man of God, the prophet of God, uh, rearranged all the things, uh, put the wood in order, then did something that nobody would have done. It, it, it makes no sense at all. And poured water all over the altar. And then he prayed and fire came down from heaven and just lapped up all the wood and all the water and all the wood. And, uh, you know, it was obvious uh, that God, the God of heavens and uh, Elijah's God, uh, you know, prevailed. And they took all the prophets of Baal and uh, they slaughtered all of them. They killed all of them. And so really, if you look at a prophet and you look at this story, Elijah was on the mountaintop. Okay, God used him in a mighty way. And here's the deal. And I want you to remember this if you don't remember every, anything else I say tonight. Beware of being on mountaintops because it can change quickly. And here's what Satan does. He can't, he can't adjust. He, he can't uh, affect what God does. God did the miracle, and we're on the mountaintop, but he can go after the person who did it. Okay? God used Elijah, and this is exactly what's going to happen in chapter 19. Elijah running from Jezebel. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and it was King Ahab, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me, or more also, if I do not make your life as the one, uh, <coughs> life uh, of the one by them tomorrow at this time. So what did she do? She put a bounty out on Elijah. And, and she said, if you are not dead by tomorrow, there's going to be a problem here. Okay? So he had a bounty on his head. In verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Why would he run? Because he knew uh, of her reputation earlier uh, he, you know, she had a hundred uh, prophets of God executed, okay? She was mean. Uh, she was angry. Anybody that got in her way, she eliminated. And isn't it crazy how you can be on the mountaintop one, one day, and, you know, uh, in the next week, you're, you're, you have fear in your life. And we've always said, folks, fear comes from Satan. The Bible tells us that. So when, when things are going good at churches, we need to be on guard for Satan's attack. He will attack uh, Christians that are very 
successful. And notice he went to Beersheba, which was about 100 miles away uh, into the south, and he left his servant there. Why would he do that? All right, he didn't want, he, he knew he had a bounty on him, so he was trying to spare his servant's life, is what I believe. But verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that night that he might die. Do you see the wave? You see how fast things can change in your life? He's on the mountaintop defeating 850 uh, you know, uh, servants of Baal and, and seeing God work in a mighty way. And then let's just say it was three days later, down as low as you could get and wanting to die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And folks, you know, King, King Ahab had told Jezebel what was going on. And uh, you have to understand uh, that we have to be on guard all the time. Okay? Satan takes no days off. All right? He's alive. He is a well. He is well. And he picks big targets. Okay? I will say this, not in a bragging manner, but I am the big target in this church. God has called me here, so I have to be on guard at all time, and that's what is going on. Uh, folks, he wants to tear things up. Uh, he wants to destroy individuals, and, and, and she got him thinking, man, I'm going to die. I would rather God kill me than Jezebel kill me, and that's the, that's the mindset sometimes. And when you run, also I want to say this, and leave a servant, and you're by yourself, Satan uses isolation, okay? He isolates people where they think they don't have a way out. And my heart goes out to people that have, uh, and families that have lost loved ones from suicide. But I'm telling you, it is satanically, you know, that the Satan just, he, he is pulling the strings. He is behind every suicide because God gives life, folks. And so we need to understand, he went from a, his highest high to his lowest low. Psalm 18. Go with me to Psalm 18, if you would. Psalm 18, verse 1. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God my strength in whom I will trust, my shield, the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Folks, I preach this Sunday night. We're under the divine protection of God. And we have to realize that when that satanic attack comes, when he plants those seeds of fear and doubt in your life, you have to run to God, not run away from God. Elijah running from Jezebel. Number two, Eli Elijah in a cave. Now look at this. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. You have to understand, he was trying to get as far away from Jezebel as he could, as quickly as he could. He was making this journey, and, and, I, and I, I really believe he was running most of the time because he had that fear, and he, he was just afraid, and he didn't even stop to eat. And yeah, he may have stopped to get something to drink, but, but you know, just running and, and physically tired. And by the way, folks, we need to learn to rest, okay? Because when we are physically tired, we do not make good decisions. We don't say the right things when we're tired, okay? We're one of the seven dwarfs, and he's called grumpy, okay? We need to have time to slow down. And I believe with all my heart, that's one of the things Satan is doing in our world today. He is keeping us so busy, we're tired all the time. We're tired when we go to bed, and we're tired when we get up. I mean, Elijah ran for his life, 
Elijah had that fear going on. He was isolated. He didn't have anybody to encourage him. He was just running and getting as far away as he could. And so he was tired and obviously he was hungry. And isn't it neat that God can send angels to feed his prophets? Folks, God can do anything. And he, seeing how Elijah's was, Elijah was, sent food and touched him and said, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. Well, we know Elijah didn't do it. So who did it? Folks, it was God. All right? It wasn't, nobody else was around. And God provided. Folks, our God can do that. And we have to realize there's no such thing as an impossible situation with God. God saw what was going on. God saw that he was hurting. God saw that he was down. God saw that he was desperate. God heard him when he said, just let me die. And he provided fresh baked cakes in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. All right? I don't know about you, but there's times, man, after you eat a big meal or a good meal, you just want to take a nap. I've learned this. And you know, my parents used to do this on Sundays. When I was a teenager, they'd take a nap every Sunday afternoon. And I thought, why would you waste time taking a nap? Do you know what I do every Sunday afternoon? I study my scripture for the night. I take a nap and then I go over it again. I'm doing the same things my parents did when, 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 uh, you know, when they were doing that. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him. And folks, there's something about a touch, okay? Something about a touch. I love to pray with people, and I love to pray with people holding their hands. There's just something about that assurance. When people come down, all right? They put their hand out, and, and, and I try to just hang on to them and, and pray for them. And he said, arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he was taking care of not only the physical part, you know, of, of him getting rest, but also the eating, the nourishment that he needs. Verse 8, so he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights, as far as uh, Horeb, the mountain of God, which again is Mount Sinai, and we know all that went on there before. So what did he have? He had a 40-day journey. Can you imagine that? All I have to say is that has to be a great meal if it's going to last you 40 days. But again, folks, God provided. God provided. And then it says, so he arose and ate and drank his horbid, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you hiding? Why are you in a cave? Why are you running? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they, see, and they seek to take my life. What was Elijah doing? He was delusional at this time. What was he saying? I am the only one in Israel serving you. Okay? And folks, again, you know, Satan puts these thoughts in your head, okay, you know, and and, you know, he magnifies things uh, that are not true. And God basically was calling them out. He was just saying, listen, that, that is not right. That is not what's going on here. All right? There are more people uh, in Israel that love God and, 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 and are serving God. Look at Psalm 3. Psalm 3. I hope the psalm means as much to you. I love the psalm. There are just so many. Uh, you know, one of the things I love to do, take a, you know, the days of the week, you know, 
and, and just like today's the 16th, read the 16th Psalm and read the 16th Proverbs and just go through like that. It really uh, blesses you. Look at, look at Psalm 3. And, and this is David, of course, wrote the Psalm when he was fleeing from Absalom, his son. His own son turned on him. Okay? Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help from him in God. And then he says, but you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept and awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Folks, God is not going to abandon you when you need him most. But he's just waiting for you to say, God, I need your help. And here's the deal, folks. People get down. I mean, even as a Christian, you can't live on the mountaintop all the time. You're going to go in the valley sometimes. Uh, there's going to be times when, when you're just thinking, man, it, you know, I go to church all the time and I do all these things and things still happen to me. Folks, let me tell you what that is called. L-I-F-E. Life. Just these last 10 days, Lori just looking at me, and uh, we, we had a leak under our slab of our house. And she, she, we'd got it three, three months ago. We'd got a new floor, a brick floor, and of course it's under in the laundry room under there. So two days ago, they're in Lori's laundry room, jacking up, some, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord. Toilet had problems, electricity had problems, and I simply said, Lori, you can't worry about this stuff, okay? Everyone has problems. We have to give it to the Lord. Folks, nobody lives in a bubble. Bad things happen to good people. And at the time when we're like that, folks, we have to run towards God, not away from God. Now back, and let's finish this up. Verse 11, Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong storm, windstorm tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in the pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. Who makes the wind? Exactly. Okay? And sometimes God does use the wind but he wasn't in the wind. And after that, uh, after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And an earthquake will get your attention. But folks, God doesn't always do mighty things like that. Okay, it's not always huge or big or life-changing things. And after that, earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in a fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And here's what I, I believe with all my heart, folks. We stay so busy, and even in doing the Lord's work, that we don't shut everything out and just listen for the voice of God. Folks, I am telling you, God speaks to you. God talks to you. We have to use the Word. We have to stay in the Word and get direction from God. We have to stay on our knees in prayer. God's not playing hide and seek with you. God's not up in the heavens getting the lightning bolts and thinking, I'll get, I'll, I'll get you. All right, he's not. Things happen. But folks, sometimes God just speaks in that still, small voice. And if we won't turn the TV off, if we won't get off our computers, if we don't shut the music off, folks, we cannot hear the voice 
of God. And that's what I believe had happened. He was looking at everything around him and all the bad things that were going on and did not pay attention to the small voice of God. Look at verse 13. So it was when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and says, what are you doing here? God is speaking directly to Elijah. And he asked him twice, I'm going to ask you again, why are you here? And what are you doing? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts because the children of Israel has forsaken your covenant, tore down the altars. What did he do? He gave the same answer. That's called insanity, folks. <laughs> when you do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. That's crazy. Okay, God obviously was trying to teach this guy, this guy a lesson, uh, this prophet. And he said, killed your prophets, I am alone, and, and they seek to uh, take my life. Then the Lord said to him, go, return your way into the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, what was the key word in what I just read? Don't stay there. Folks, when you get down, when you get depressed, when you feel like everyone's against you, don't stay there. See, there are people that live in parties. And do you know what party it is? The pity party. Woe is me. I'm the only one, Tony. Ain't nobody else doing it. I work my tail off. I, 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 I. Well, that'll tell you something right there. When all your sentences begin with I, you are the problem. Okay? People get down. I, I am not making light of that in any way. Elijah was down. But folks, he, you know, when you get to a mountaintop, you need to thank God that you were there. Folks, there are a lot of people that don't get to the mountaintop. A lot of people. So you thank God for what he's done in your life, and you give God the glory for everything that, that's happening great in your life. So I didn't tell you the, the word, did I? I circled it in my Bible. G-O. Don't sit. Don't keep feeling sorry for yourself. Go. Because you know what I've found out as a Christian? I am most happy when I'm ministering to other people. When I forget what's going on in my house, or I'm not going to worry about what's going on in my house, and I invest in the life of others. See, he, he just was having a pity party, and God was trying to tell him, man, this ain't working. This is not working. And what did he do? Three things here. He told him to do this. Uh, Turn your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. That's one. You also need to anoint Jehu. Uh, as king over Israel. And number three, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, uh, you shall anoint as a prophet in your place. What did God give him? Really, there was four things he asked him to do. Replace yourself. Folks, I'm telling you, I believe everyone, everyone that is a Christian ought to invest in someone's life that is younger than them so that when we get old and we can't physically serve. That person goes in there and he takes our place in that. Okay? That's what discipleship is. That's what ministry is. And folks, I'm just telling you, I'm, get, I, I'm 66 years old. And I mean, I, my prayer is I can do it six more years. My goal is to do it 10 more years. My prayer is six because I'll have 50 years in the ministry. But my goal is is till the day I die also. But there's going to be a time when I'm going to have to close my Bible, when I'm going to have to say physically, mentally, emotionally, I can't do this anymore. And that's why we need to be able to, uh, you know, uh, disciple people that are going to come beside us and learn from us, and then they take the reins. In verse 17, it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Hazel, Hazel uh, Jehu will kill. Whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elijah will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal. And folks, again, 
cut your pity party short. <laughs> okay, cut it short. Quit feeling sorry for yourself and do things that will fulfill that spiritual void that you have in your life. Proverbs 3, you know this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it anyway. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Psalm 23, we know it, but I'm going to read it anyway. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. Folks, God is in the restoration business. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And here's the verse I wanted you to see. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Folks, everybody walks through that valley. Everybody. But I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. I hope you do this when you're really, really down. Because sometimes I have to do this. I have to write down everything that God has done for me. And then everything that Satan has thrown against me. And I'm telling you, this list far outweighs this list. See, Satan wants us to dwell on the negative side of life where God says, I, have, I want you to have life and I want you to have abundant life. John 10, 10. Okay. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you realize that you can worship anywhere? You can worship at home. You can worship in your car. You can worship on a mountaintop. You can worship watching the sun go down. But the key, folks, there is to worship. You know, Elijah did something that you and I will never do. What did he do? God sent a chariot for him. Now, I understand the rapture of the church, but I don't see any, I don't see us going up on chariots. So what did God say? Elijah, you're not even going to taste death. I mean, you look all through Genesis, and at the end of that, he lived 544 years and he died. Okay, but there's 969 years and he died. God rewarded him. Paul, wouldn't it be cool <laughs> if God just sent a chariot down? That would be one cool thing. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you that you're always with us. And God, I love the mountaintop experiences. I love to see you work in a mighty way. And God, in Elijah's life, you did. He couldn't have done what, he, what happened without your help. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And God, I know everybody gets down at times. Sometimes it's because of finances. Sometimes it's because of our health. Sometimes it's because of family. Sometimes it's because of, of just, you know, the hurt. And God, I just pray, Lord, that we wouldn't stay there. God, I pray that we would rise above those times. And God, I do pray that we would look to you. God, you are our Father. You love us very much. So God, when we get in that valley, God, I pray you'd help us start climbing that mountain again. God, we've conquered things before, and I know we can do it again. So God, I pray that this would help folks tonight. God, I pray, Lord, that we would trust you in all situations in life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.